For many, many years we have taken the time to honor this great country that we live in and also those that have fought for our freedom and are currently fighting for our freedom. And so I ask that you stand as the Lucasville Legion as they come and present our callers this evening. And after they present the callers, Miss Karen Peck will sing our national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket Thank you. You may be seated. We wish to thank the Lucasville Post 363 for presenting our callers this evening. Thank you, gentlemen. They do a great service to our community, not only them, but several legions across this county and area are there with the, uh, in the funeral services whenever there's a military personnel that died and that's always a moving part and we wish to thank them and we want to take this moment and opportunity to thank all of the veterans that are in attendance with us here in just a few moments we will pay a medley of the armed forces and when you hear your armed forces branch we want you to come up front and we want to honor you I wish we had the whole week that we could just have you set up here and we could take the time to tell you how much we love you and appreciate you. For without you, I don't say this facetiously, I don't say this to try to be overdramatic, but without your service, we could not do what we do tonight. There's just no way around it. You've given us the freedom that we take for granted, and I pray we never take for granted. I was, when I was raised, my mom and dad always raised me to be respectful to our military, those that are currently serving and those that are had have served. And I know a lot of people in recent years have taken upon themselves, whenever they see a veteran, they'll say thank you for your service. 
And there's not been a single one of them that would say, oh, I'm, you know, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Though they, They're humble. They say it's what we were supposed to do, and it was my honor. Every one of them, it was my honor. And so today we're just going to take these few moments because you so richly deserve them. And we're going to ask when you hear your, your branch, we want you to come, and we want you to stand up here as we can honor you this evening. Go ahead, John. United States Army. United States Navy. United States Coast Guard. United States Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, get on your feet and make the real heroes of this nation. Give them honor they deserve tonight. Praise the Lord. We thank God for it. God bless America. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jim. God bless you. You may be seated before these gentlemen go down. Gentlemen, honor your brother back there was unable to make it up. We want to give you honor, brother. Vietnam veteran sitting back there unable to. Thank you, brother, for your service. Tom Tomlin is also back here. He wasn't able to make it up front. Thank you, Tom, for your service as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Will we happen to have any parents or grandparents that are here this evening that have uh, a, a 
grandson, a granddaughter, a son or a daughter that is currently serving in our military. If you do, would you stand? We'd like to honor you. God bless you. Thank you. We pray for you. We pray for you. Young people, the men and women you saw up here on this stage, they're the real heroes of this nation. They're the ones we need to honor and give credit where credit is due. I think God honors us for what we're doing here tonight. Amen. If you see a veteran this week and they're out at a restaurant, pay for their food. Let them know how much you appreciate it, okay? Brother Greg, come on. Choir, go ahead and make your way up. Brother Greg's going to lead us in some singing. Bless you, brother. Choir, go ahead and come on up. All right, choir, Mark Bear has sent out an SOS tonight. I guess that's military, an SOS. Scoot over some. Make room for everybody up here. How about that? Let's sing it. My heavenly home is right and fair. I feel like traveling on. No pain or death can enter there. I feel like. Sing it out. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling.
you're hearing today we wrote these songs from our trips to Israel that was one of them I had a vision of a book when I was over in Israel I guess it was um, uh, the day I'm not sure which day it was but we tour all day and and uh, there was a, a, a book in my mind when I went to bed that night and it was just like the Lord was saying now listen you got to get people's names in that book and so we got to sing the gospel sing the truth and that's what we want to do. We want to sing the truth to you all here tonight. And that is Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. And then we also wrote some of these songs when we were battling COVID and going through grief. And it was just, it's been crazy. And um, have a grandbaby that's in heaven. Her name's Isabel. But 13 months later, the Lord gave us a joy and gave us a little Isle of Grace. I'm a grandma. Back in 2020 of June, I got COVID-19. It was all so new, I didn't even know who to compare it to because I didn't know anybody else that had it. But weeks prior to that, my husband's great nephew, 21 years old, overdosed. And our family was devastated. I was sitting out in the front yard with COVID-19 and thinking about how sad our family was. And I got to thinking, our, all of our dates had canceled. Had no dates. Y'all blessed us beyond measure, I'll have to tell you. We'll never forget it. All of the church doors had shut. People were fighting in the streets, burning down buildings. We're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Who would have ever thought that in 2021, uh, well, 2020 at the time? And then on top of that, we're in the middle of an election and everybody's hating everybody. And I just remember saying, God, I know you're not taken aback by all of this. So if you are allowing it to happen, help me learn from this. I'm going to pray my way out of this and I'm going to write my way out of it. So I called a couple of writers in Nashville. And we did it on the phone, and I said, I've got COVID-19, just want y'all to know. And I'm not feeling well, but we have got to write about what's happening right now. And they said, now this is hard stuff. Are you sure you want to say this in a song? And I said, I do, because I think if it's ever a time that we as Christians need to step up and be the salt and the light to this world, it's now. Amen. And that's what this says. Hard to believe what the world's come to. Hard to wrap my head around everything I see on the news. Hard to sit back and do nothing in all this mess. What's it going to take to fix this broken Watching politics making us enemies. Tired of seeing anger and violence spilling out in the street. And I'm tired of addiction taking life's way too young. Oh, what's it gonna take to fix what this world's become? The answer is Jesus. The answer is love, and for everything we're needing, I believe that He will be enough. The answer is Jesus.
where Jesus would stand, where he healed, loved, and forgave. I've witnessed the scene. He silenced with peace just one whisper the way. And I felt the ground where he knelt down in the garden, knowing what was to come. And I know the place he buried his face, praying. And I've walked the streets that carried his feet to Mount Calvary, where he gave up his life. I've stood on the hill where his blood was spilled on the cross, where and died. I've seen the grave where his body lay, where they said, surely this was the
gets to me just trying to make ends meet she's just one check away from losing it all there's a broken man i know he's barely holding on to hope he's just one check away from losing it all That no one else can see And without Jesus tell me Where would I be? Everybody's going through something Come on, sing it with us Everybody faces a storm now and then So if everybody's going through something I'd rather They waited for Jesus, he did not come, and they wondered why. The death watch was over, buried four days. Somebody said, he'll soon be here, the Lord's on his way.
she said, Lord, you don't understand. He's been there four days. The gravestone was rolled back. Then Jesus cried. Lazarus, come forth. Then somebody said, He's alive. Praise the Lord. If you just minded the Lord and come to the altar, I'd wait and preach tomorrow night. God is faithful. Thank Him for His presence. Thank Him for His power. Thank Him for Karen Peck and New River. Turn to Luke chapter 8. I won't hold you very long. I can say a lot in a little bit if you say amen. amen. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> if I hear anybody complaining about the warm weather, I'm, you, uh, no, no one's complaining, right? It's the first good day, we've, first good couple days we've had all year. Amen. Feels just fine. Amen. Get in the Holy Ghost, it don't matter how hot it is anyway. Amen. 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 Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, familiar scripture, familiar story. In fact, the very first sermon I preached here 20 years ago was on this very subject. It was on a Tuesday night. I think Calray still regrets the decision. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm blessed beyond measure. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, say immediately, immediately. her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, who touched me? 
When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. And she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Go in peace. You may be seated. Thank you. I'll be 47 this September. I've been in church. No comments, please. (laughs) Been in church almost 48 years, if you count in my womb, in my mother's womb. My first year of life, I was in over 360 services. And this is all I've ever known. And by no way am I complaining about that. God has been better to me than I deserve. And thank God for his grace. But I can tell you, there is nothing, nothing greater in life than to feel the touch of Jesus. Nothing greater. When he touches you at at creation, your life is molded and made into his image. And just because it's such a hot topic, I'll go ahead and tell you all this in case you didn't know. Life doesn't begin at birth. It begins at conception. In fact, I would say it begins before conception in the mind of God. That's how much I believe it. And abortion... Regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, it's still murder. And it doesn't matter what decision is made by the high court, the decision has already been made in the book. But when he touches you at creation, your life is molded and made in his image. And then that special day when he touches you at conversion. Hmm. You remember that day when the, the hand that made this universe, the hand that created the worlds in six days, you remember the day when he came down and touched you and made you realize that you needed much more than this life has to offer. You needed a savior. You needed to be saved. And, and aren't you thankful for old-fashioned conviction that when he touched you, You knew you were sick, you were miserable, and I think our prayers should be changing here as Christ is nearing his return. We shouldn't be praying for people to be saved. We need to pray for people to be lost and get under conviction because if they truly get under conviction, they'll get saved. (laughs) But when he touches you at conversion, your life is never the same. Uh, God touched me at the age of five years old and I didn't understand a lot. I knew a lot about script. I knew, I knew the Bible verses. I knew the, the Sunday school lesson. But I also knew that if I died, I was going to hell. And the reason I got saved on September the 6th, 1981, my Uncle Gary is here tonight. He was preaching at my father's church, and he was preaching about hell. And I remember the sermon. I remember shaking in my seat because I knew if I died right then, I was going to hell. I didn't get saved that night because I, I I love the Lord like I love him now. I just didn't want to go to hell. And that's good enough reason. And he touched me. And I was saved. I was converted. Never the same. And as life moves on, we just don't stop at the touch of conversion. When he touches you and you are consecrated and set apart for his work and his will in your life, there's nothing... Nothing 
There's nothing that takes the place of being saved. But then you're, there'll come a time in your life when you need a special touch from God. And regardless of what area you are in your life, regardless of the denomination, I really don't matter. It really don't matter to me. But there's a point in your life when you're going to need a special touch from God, whether it be in the ministry, whether it be to reach the next level. But I'm telling you what, folks, if you don't have the touch of God on your life, you are not going to last. But after he touched me at consecration, I've continued needing his touch. When crisis comes, I need his touch. When my baby girl was just a few months old and she came down with an E. coli infection and we, 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 uh, we found out that she had a birth defect and she was gonna have to have surgery at just a few months old. She was very sick and we didn't know exactly what to do. And when those doors closed at Children's Hospital and your baby goes one way and you can't go any farther, I cried to the Lord, I said, Lord, we need your touch. And she's sitting right back there with Mamma and Papa. 22 years later, God's good. At the age of 13 years old, when crisis came into my own life personally, and the doctors told me I would be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and I thought my life was over, and I realized I was just a kid and realized that I didn't understand a lot of things, but that hit us pretty hard. And my mama held me in my, I don't care, I was 13, I don't care, I ain't ashamed to tell you, I'll still let her hold me, I don't care, I'm 46 years old. But anyway, I climbed into my mama's lap, and she held me, and I cried, and we cried together, and I said, Mama, what are we going to do? And she said, we'll do what we've always done. We ask for God to touch us and help us. Well over 30 years now, I've not been in the hospital one time for diabetes related issues. God is faithful. But I needed his touch. I needed his touch. And I'm, please, don't, please, please, I'm not trying to be over dramatic or trying to be an evangelist and make up stuff. Just to tell you, I'm trying to be transparent and real with you. But two weeks ago, when something happened in my own life personally, I will not go into it. It's between me and God. And for the first time in 28 years, the words came out of my lips, I don't think I can do this anymore. And I said, Lord, I need your touch. I need your touch. He said, Brian, how can you say that? Don't ever say that'll never happen to you. Elijah prayed fire down from heaven. A chapter later, he's sitting under a juniper tree wanting to die. It can happen. I needed his touch. And can I tell you, every time I've asked him to touch me, without fail, he's touched me. <laughs> It may have been in a sermon. It may have been in prayer time. It may have been in a song. It may have been in a testimony. It may have been in a friend just giving you a call and saying, I don't know, but I had you on my heart today. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, bro, but I'm praying for you. I'll tell you what, that's how you know God's in control and he can touch you. And I know by a raised hand tonight how many have ever asked for God to touch them and he has come down and he has touched you. Isn't it a wonderful feeling to know that you're touched by God? And if there's ever a woman in the Bible that needed a touch from the master, it was this woman. Nameless. Found in three, gospels, three of the gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, and, John, and Luke. All three have a different view, and Luke, the physician, tells us a little bit different view that I like uh, apart from the others. Gives us a little bit more detail. And if ever a woman needed a touch in the body, think about this, folks. She was, she was nameless. She was known by her disease. She was nameless. All she known was as the woman with an issue of blood. And the reality was she was living under a curse. A curse. You say, Brian, it was just a disease. How can it be a curse? Oh, you don't, you don't, if you don't know and have ever studied this woman and the curse that she was on, she lived in a curse. If she ever got out of the house, 
She would have to walk down the street on the other side of the road. She could not walk by people. She could not bump into people. Everywhere she went, she had to cry, unclean, unclean. She had the marks of someone that was sick. No doubt most Bible scholars believe that she, uh, with this hemorrhaging, she was very anemic, so she was very pale. But wherever she went, she had to cry, unclean, unclean. She felt isolated. She felt rejected. She felt discriminated. That's a curse, my friend. If you've ever been discriminated or if you've ever felt isolated or if you ever felt neglected, I'm telling you, it feels like you're walking around and under a, a rain cloud and you'll never get out from under it. It's a curse. And if you think it wasn't that important, you go back to the book of Leviticus and there's chapters just developed about people that have an issue of blood. Do you, listen now. If she sat on a chair and that chair wasn't cleansed, if someone came after her and sat in that chair, they were considered unclean. You talk about walking around with a stigma. You talk about walking around with a heavy burden. This woman was under a curse. And the reality of it is tonight, folks, we are living under a curse. Everyone that has been born into this world is born with a curse. You say, what is that curse, Brian? The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't think you're going to get to heaven by your good merit. Don't think you're going to get there because of your name or your lineage. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And just like this woman, you need a touch from the Savior. The Bible says she spent all her living. This is my assumption and my research. I believe she was a widow. And I believe that added to her isolation. And I believe every time she had, she spent on physicians to make her better. The Bible says in another account that she spent all she had and nothing made her better. In fact, it made her worse. Research will tell you there's over 11 different remedies for a woman with an issue of blood. And uncle, I believe she tried every single one of them. I believe she tried every single one of them and nothing made her better. It was a curse. And folks, you can try all the world's methods. You can try anything apart from the Savior in order to get rid of the curse of sin, but you'll never do it. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's only one way to get rid of the curse, and that's through and by the blood. The reality was she was under a curse. But notice the resistance that came from the crowd. She had an obstacle. She got to the point. She's like, you know what? I need help. And it really don't matter to me how big the crowd is. It really don't matter to me how many people are around. She got to the point where she needed help and she needed healing and she needed a touch. And the Bible says that when she had heard... You say, what'd she hear? I'll tell you what she heard. She heard about Jesus that could heal the sick, that could restore a withered hand, that could raise death to life, that could turn water into wine. She heard about this man, and she thought, you know what? I've tried everything else. I may as well try and get a touch from the master. But she faced resistance. Anytime you try to get close to God, you're going to face resistance. Any try you cry, any time you try and get a touch from him, any time you pray and say, Lord, take me to a new level, guess what's going to happen? Here comes the resistance. And she came up against a crowd. This wasn't just a big crowd. The Bible calls it a press. The same word used in Mark chapter 2, whenever Jesus was inside a house, and remember, four men brought this man that was crippled, and he was wanting to be healed, and the Bible said they couldn't get through the door because of the press. That word press just doesn't mean, in the Greek, it doesn't just mean a large crowd. It means a large, angry 
crowd. They were mean. <laughs> you ever try to get close to God and you run into some mean people? Most of the time they're sitting in church pews. I got some advice for everybody. Instead of trying to fix other people, won't you sweep around your own door? I can look around here and there's some wonderful people, but none of us are growing angel wings. None of us are perfect. Some of us make mistakes. And some of us, God and the Holy Spirit's already pointed out our mistakes. We don't need you to help him. That was free right there. Feel about 10 foot tall and bulletproof. It's Cal Ray's line, I can use it. Everybody else uses this stuff, so I might as well use it. Resistance from the crowd. But she said, it don't matter. It don't matter what resistance I face. I've got to press my way through the press in order to get to Jesus. I just need a touch. And folks, when are we going to realize the resistance will always be there? The problem's not in the resistance. The problem is in your desire. Do you care enough to get to Jesus that you'll press through the crowd to get to him? The reality was she was under a curse. But then resistance came from the crowd. But finally notice the results that brought a cure. The Bible says, she, she, in her mind, she's like, if I, could just, if I could just get to him. I don't have time. 20 years ago, I preached about the garment, prayer show. I don't have time to get into that. But that's what she said. If I could just get to the lowest point, maybe I could crawl past all the people on my hands and feet. But if I could just touch that little the little tassel hanging down off of his prayer shawl. If I could just, if I could just touch that. And the Bible says she, she reached out. Every ounce of strength she had touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says immediately she was healed. How many of you believe that God can do it immediately? How many of you have ever experienced the healing of God? Immediately. Sometimes he chooses to wait, but I'm thankful that when we pray and when we touch the hem of his garment, hallelujah, he comes down and immediately does the work. He can do it. I believe he can. I've seen it happen too many times to know that he can do it immediately. How many of you believe she was healed immediately? Of course she was what the Bible says. Then Jesus says something odd. He says, who touched me? And Peter said, paraphrasing, there's a bunch of people here. Everybody's touching you. What do you mean who touched me? He said, no, 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 you don't understand. Somebody. <laughs> Somebody has touched me. You know what he was saying? He said, Peter, I'm not talking about touching my clothes. Somebody has touched my heart. So much that the virtue, healing virtue has went out of my body. And someone around here has a miracle in their life. And when he turned around, he saw her and she was lying there. And when the seeker was out. <laughs> she said, you know what? I might as well go ahead and tell you. It was me. Like he didn't know. <laughs> of course he knew. But sometimes he wants us to acknowledge that we've been touched. <laughs> that we've been healed. It's not enough just to be healed. Thank God we've got to tell somebody what Jesus has done. Say it was me. It was me who touched you. I touch you. And he said, daughter, well, that's a word she hadn't heard. Do you, do you realize that under that curse, she was ostracized from the family of God? 
She wasn't allowed in. <laughs> you missed a good place to shout. I wish I had some Bible readers around here. Amen. What I told you, she, she was ostracized from the family. She wasn't allowed in the family with the curse. But now that the curse is gone, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. She was healed immediately. But he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. She was healed immediately. But Jesus took the time to make sure that she was made whole. Why? There's other miracles in the Bible that where people were healed but Jesus never touched them. You'll never read in this account that Jesus touched this woman. No. He never touched her. But she was still healed. There's other, I think there's around four other miracles where Jesus didn't touch somebody and they were healed. Some of it was spoken word. Some of it was in, in other instances, but all of it was their faith. But in those instances where he didn't touch them, you'll find that he turned the tables and made sure that they were whole. And this woman here was made whole. How many of you believe she was healed immediately? But Jesus was more concerned about her being made whole. You say, Brian, what are you trying to get? I preached the whole message to get to this point. How many of you believe Jesus didn't touch her? Go home and read it, I promise. I'm not, I'm not lying. There's other people in the Bible that he touched. He healed them, but they weren't made whole. This woman... Didn't touch him. She was healed and made whole. So what's the difference? Here's the difference. Are you ready? It's one thing when Jesus touches you. But it's a whole other thing when you touch him. That was the difference. The reason why Jesus took the time to make sure that she was made whole. He was wanting to know, are you concerned about getting fixed? Or do you want to be found? Are you concerned with just getting your miracle? Or do you want to be made new? I really believe that we have a church world full of people that are so caught up on getting a miracle, please, don't let, let me finish. They're more concerned about getting a miracle more than they are getting the master. And I believe Jesus can heal people that aren't saved. I've seen it happen. But you cannot be made whole. You can be healed when Jesus touches you, but you cannot be whole until you touch him. It's time for us as a church to get past asking God, Lord, touch us. It's time for us to be like this woman and say, Lord, I need to touch you. It's about pursuing God. Do we really want revival? Do you? Do you, is it just lip service or do you want it? If you want it, you'll pursue him. If you want it, you'll reach out and touch him. If you want your family to be saved, it goes beyond asking for a touch. You've got to touch him. Touch him. You say, how do I do it? 
This woman gives us the formula. Karen, would you care to come and sing us, sing Pray Now? Would you care to do that? Please. Here's the formula. How was she made whole? She touched him. We know that. But Jesus tells us, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy touch have made the... Hey, you're listening, Elsie. No. Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Faith. In believing, everything she had heard was real. Everything she had assumed, what people had told her was a reality, she finally got to experience because she touched the Lord. This altar call is very simple. Some of you just need to touch Jesus. If you need to come and stand, come and stand. If you can't kneel, that's fine. If you want to bring you a seat, bring a seat. But if we really want revival in this community, in this county, in this nation, we got to touch him. We got to touch him.